When did the dinosaurs arise on Earth? What were some of the first dinosaurs? How and where did they live? Join us as we discover the history of the first of the mightiest beasts the Earth has ever known, the dinosaurs. Triceratops Triceratops is one of the most popular dinosaurs ever. But what do we know about this species so far? Let us take a look at its story, its history. Triceratops' name was derived from the Greek language, tri meaning three, and ceratops meaning horned face. Triceratops is a genus of plant-eating ceratopsid dinosaur, characterized by beaks, rows of shearing teeth in the back of the jaw, nasal horns, and a frill on the back of the head. Triceratops, Taurosaurus, and Centrosaurus are only a few that belong to the more advanced ceratopsids group, the Chasmosaurinae. In 1887, George Lyman Cannon found the first Triceratops fossil specimen of a pair of brow horns attached to a skull roof near Denver, Colorado. This specimen was sent to the American paleontologist Othniel Charles Marsh. Initially, Marsh believed that the remains belonged to a large bison. He based his hypothesis on the fact that the bones were found in the formation dated from the Pliocene. Since the first discovery, more specimens, ranging from hatchling to adult, have been found. Triceratops lived in the western part of North America in the last three million years of the Cretaceous period around 68 to 66 million years ago. It was one of the last non-avian dinosaurs to evolve. Triceratops was a very large animal, reaching 8 to 9 meters or 26 to 30 feet in length and 5 to 9 tons in weight. It retained short hands with three hooves each and short feet with four hooves each. It walked on all fours with most of their fingers pointing out and away from the body. Triceratops' body weight was carried by only the first three fingers of the hand, whilst digits four and five had not developed and lacked claws or hooves. Recent physical and digital reconstructions of skeletons show that Triceratops and other ceratopsids maintained an upright stance during their normal movements the elbows flexed to behind and slightly bowed out in an intermediate state between fully upright and fully sprawling, as in the modern rhinoceros. The vertebral column consists of 10 neck, 12 back, 10 sacral and about 45 tail vertebra. The front neck vertebra was fused into a sine cervical. Like all chasmosaurins, Triceratops had the most striking and gigantic skull that was almost as big as a third of its entire body. The largest specimen found had a skull of an estimated size of 2.5 meters or 8.2 feet in length when complete. The skull bore a single horn on the snout above the very large circular nostrils and a pair of brow horns approximately one meter or 3.3 feet long above each eye. There was an extended frill of bone on the back of the skull with as many as 19 to 26 small spikes called hypoxipitals. Smaller horn-like spikes were also on the jugal or cheekbones. The bones of the skull roof were fused. Most of the skull was covered in a material made of blood vessels similar to that found under the keratinous beaks of living birds. This suggests that the dinosaur's entire head, aside from the cheeks and the area around the nostrils, was covered in keratin while it was still alive. Many modern birds have very colorful keratin, suggesting that Triceratops' skull may also have been full of color. Even though the Triceratops was quite a large animal, it was prey to predators 
such as Tyrannosaurus rex. A partial Triceratops fossil collected in 1997 shows a bitten-off horn. The bite marks match that of Tyrannosaurus teeth. Fortunately for the affected Triceratops, its injuries healed after being bitten and the animal survived the attack. Encounters may not always have happened between different animals. As another piece of fossil shows puncture marks on male Triceratops frills, it is possible the species use their horns to fight each other, probably to attract mates. Triceratops is mainly known from skulls found from different skeletons from embryos to adults. It shows how the skull, especially the frill, would undergo dramatic changes in shape throughout its life. Triceratops had a parrot-like beak. The upper and lower jaws were lined with stacked columns of 400 to 800 shearing teeth, arranged in batteries. The worn teeth were constantly replaced with new ones. Only a small percentage of these teeth were in use at any one time. Triceratops was a herbivore, and its diet would have consisted mostly of shrubs and other low-lying vegetations. It may have used its body strength or horns to crop larger plants such as palms, cycads, or tree ferns in order to get their fruit or leaves. This vegetation was quite tough to chew and fibrous, and would have taken a lot of processing and digesting. Other ceratopsians the horned dinosaurs are known from bone beds preserving carcasses from two to hundreds or even thousands of individuals. This is not the case for Triceratops. Although small groups of juvenile Triceratopses have been discovered in the Hills Creek Formation in Montana, USA, however, the adult individual's fossil was usually found alone or with no more than two or three individuals it seems the Triceratops probably lived most of their time on their own. There are currently two species of Triceratops recognized, namely Triceratops horridus and Triceratops prosus, although considerably more species have been proposed. One of the most famous Triceratops species is Cliff the Triceratops, whose remains can be seen at the Boston Museum of Science. Oviraptor. The discovery of the first Oviraptor philoceratops occurred during one of the Central Asiatic expeditions organized by Roy Chapman Andrews in the 1920s and funded by the museum. Olsen, one of the team members, discovered a skeleton of the adult Oviraptor in a bed of red sandstone in Sabarak Usul, the Gobi Desert, Mongolia. The fossil was taken back to the museum for further examination. Osborne, who himself was a paleontologist and president of the museum at the time, published an article on the specimen in 1924. He argued that the specimen was unique and deserved a new species designation and named them Oviraptor philoceratops, from the Latin term egg and robber. Only four inches of sandstone separated the adult skull from the eggs initially thought to belong to Protoceratops, an early Ceratopsian horned dinosaur. It was hypothesized that the Oviraptor died in a sandstorm while attempting to rob a nest for nutritious eggs. The theory was based on the fact that it was common to find Proceratops fossils and their eggs in the area. However, it wasn't possible to prove it, as there were no exposed embryos in these eggs. The reputation of the Oviraptor as an egg thief continued. Scientists from Poland and Russia questioned the association between Proceratops and these eggs. In 1993, a team led by Mark Norrell recovered the skeleton of an embryo also in the Gobi Desert, but at a site called Ukar Tolgard. The nearly complete embryo was one of a large nest 
that had approximately 20 eggs. The eggshells were studied under a microscope and have shown that the scientists were correct in their apprehension. The embryo was not ceratopsian, but theropod. Further discoveries of several other oviraptor skeletons that were found on the top of nests of eggs in a brooding position, exactly in the way ground-nesting modern birds do today, confirming that these dinosaurs were good parents. Its eggs were about the size of a hot dog bun. Oviraptor philoceratops was a dinosaur that resembled birds in many ways. It was small, about two meters or six and a half feet long, a lightly built predatory or omnivorous dinosaur. Its weight is estimated at 20 kilograms or just over three stones. The head was short and deep with large eye sockets surrounded by a bony ring. It had a toothless beak at the end of the well-muscled and curved jaws. A hollow crest on the top of its head contained a large basal cavity. The skull's fossil suggests that the crescent comes in variation in size and shape, possibly as a sign of maturity or even different species. The crest was similar in structure to those in many hadrosaurs or duck-billed dinosaurs. It may have been for display, producing sound or intimidation. The skull is extremely lightweight and has very large eye sockets. Oviraptor's rib cage was rigid, similar to modern birds, and it walked on two legs with well-developed hind limbs. The forelimbs were also long and slim. The three long clawed fingers were very well suited for grasping, ripping and tearing. Oviraptor had a bony tail. Scientists claimed that the Oviraptor also had feathers. These dinosaurs are believed to roam the Earth in the late Cretaceous about 85 to 75 million years ago in the Campanian stage. They lived in a semi-desert habitat in Mongolia, possibly China and North America. Oviraptor had an omnivorous diet. Its jaws would have evolved to be able to crush hard foods such as fruit, fish, shellfish like clams or even nuts. It is still debated if their jaws were good for eating eggs. Due to suspected brooding habits, it is possible that these dinosaurs may have been endothermic, as they would have had to keep the eggs warm. The main predator of Oviraptor would have been other large theropods, such as Tyrannosaurus rex. Iguanodon It is recorded that the first discovery of an Iguanodon fossil was made by Mary Ann Mantle and her husband, Dr. Gideon Algernon Mantle, in Sussex, England, in 1822. While waiting for her husband, who was visiting a patient in the village, Mary noticed something gleaming by the side of the road and decided to investigate it. The pile of stones was left there to be used to mend a road. Her discovery was a collection of relatively large teeth embedded in the rocks. Whiteman's Green, in the north part of the village, contained the yellow-brown sandstone known as Cookfield Stone. The river system contained many fossils, including turtles, crocodiles, and dinosaurs. Her husband, Gideon, an amateur paleontologist, was very intrigued by the unusual teeth and reached out to experts for advice, including George Cuvier, who is sometimes referred to as the father of paleontology. Cuvier initially thought that the teeth could be from a fish based on their external appearance. At the time, paleontology was a discipline in its birth and few people thought in these terms when discovering fossils. Although Megalosaurus's remains had been discovered and were in the collections of the Oxford University Museum of Natural History since the late 1600s, they were not described by William Buckland 
until 1824, which was two years after the discovery of these iguanodon teeth. Gideon and Buckland exchanged letters in which they shared knowledge of their fossils' discoveries. It was a race to publish their findings. Gideon published his work on Iguanodon's tooth a year later than Buckland. So it doesn't come with any surprise that the scientists did not think that the teeth might have belonged to a dinosaur. Instead, based on the external appearance, they thought that the teeth could be from a fish. They noted, however, that the fossil's internal structure was different and therefore may instead be from a new animal, such as an herbivorous reptile. When Mantle visited the Hunterian Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons in London to search for jaws and teeth of then-living reptiles with curator William Clift and his assistant curator Samuel Stutchbury, their eyes caught a well-preserved skeleton of iguana. The fossilized teeth were many times larger than that of the iguanas that they resembled. Therefore, Gideon based the name Iguanodon on the link to iguanas. The meaning of the name is Iguana Tooth. The search for more complete Iguanodon fossils continued. In 1834, some workmen accidentally blew up a block of rock in a limestone quarry near Maidstone in Kent, uncovering portions of the skeleton of an extraordinary animal. Among the bones embedded in the rock were rib fragments, vertebrae, limb bones, parts of the pelvis, as well as, crucially, part of a tooth, and a clear impression of another. When studying the iguana's remains and the living iguana species, Cyclura cornuta, the scientists were determined that Iguanodon had a horn near its snout. In 1870, another discovery proved that the spikes were thumbs rather than horns. It is believed the thumbs may have been used as defensive weapons, either against its meat-eating predators or others of its own species, but also that the spiked thumbs were specialized tools used for food preparation such as stripping foliage from branches or breaking into seeds. More complete iguanodon skeletons had been found in a Belgian coal mine in 1878. About 322 meters below the surface, near the town of Bernissart, the miners started to see some bones coated in pyrite. Louis de Pont, the head fossil preparator at the Musée Royal de Historique Naturelle de Belgique, now the Royal Belgian Institute of National Science, was informed about the discovery. He immediately travelled to the site to investigate. It took about three years to uncover around 30 iguanodon skeletons, many of which were relatively complete. All remains were packed in plaster for protection and broken into 600 blocks. The fossils were transported to Brussels to be reassembled and fitted with iron frames. Scientists were finally able to see what a complete dinosaur might have looked like. The bones were transferred in their original position, so it was possible to present the skeleton in lifestyle poses. Although knowledge of the time was that Iguanodon was bipedal, the Belgian Iguanodon remains are now too fragile to be repositioned. It has been a long time since the Benessart mine shafts were closed, filled and sealed. It is believed that more dinosaurs may have been buried there. Iguanodon remains were found in Belgium, the United Kingdom, Asia and North America. Iguanodon probably walked on all fours. Three middle fingers fused into a hoof for walking on and a fifth finger that was possibly used for grasping. It was able to stand on its hind legs and reach up for flowering plants. The dinosaur could use its hands to pull the plant closer to its beak. Its mouth is full of curved and grooved teeth for grinding plants, and its jaws can move both up and down and side to side as it eats. The structure of the muscles inside its head suggests it had a very long tongue. It is thought that these dinosaurs lived in woodland, 
where giant ferns, conifers and flowering magnolias flourished. Iguanodon was as tall as an African elephant but weighed twice as much. Therefore, Iguanodons had strong leg bones to support its bulk. Iguanodon was quite a large animal but still had its predators, such as Gigantosaurus, Oclocanthosaurus, the massive crocodilian Socosuchus, and the dromosaurs Deinonychus and the giant Euteraptor. Bruhaschiosaurus At the late Cretaceous period, the sauropods were no longer the principal herbivores as the ornithopods took over from them. The titanosaurids were the last group of sauropods to appear. They flourished, spreading primarily over southern continents with only some example of northern lands. Titanosaurids' name was taken from the titans giants in ancient Greek mythology. Despite their name, many titanosauruses were small in size, sometimes reaching less than 12 meters or 40 foot in length. These gigantic sauropods are known from very incomplete remains. Only few titanosaurid skulls have been found. The skull fragments that we know show a wide, steeply sloping head and thin peg-like teeth with tapering crowns. These dinosaurs walked on four legs, had long tails, long necks, and small heads. They differed from other sauropods, however, in that the titanosaurs' bodies were stockier and their limbs produced a wider stance than other sauropods. Titanosaurs were high browsers, eating leaves and branches from tall trees. Argentinosaurus is currently accepted as the biggest dinosaur. However, the remains of even bigger animals called Bruhaschiosaurus were found in the southern part of India. In the Tiruchipurali district of the Tamil Nandu state in the Kalamedo formation around 1978. The rocks from this formation are dated to the Maastrichtian stage of the late Cretaceous about 70 million years ago. The fossilized remains include hip bones, the ilium, the ischium, partial leg bones, femur and tibia, a forearm radius and a tall bone part of a vertebra. Initially, the researchers Yadagiri and Ayasami thought that the fossil belonged to a monstrous carnosaur-like Allosaurus theropod. They announced in 1987 that the animal is estimated as bigger than South American Titanosaur Argentinosaurus and its length is about 40 meters or 131 feet and weighed over 80 tons. It was Charter G who re-examined and reclassified it as a Titanosaur sauropod in 1995. The generic name Bruhaschiosaurus is derived from a combination of the Sanskrit word Bruhaskya or Brahat, meaning huge or heavy, and Kaya, meaning body, and the Greek Sauros, meaning lizard. The specific epithet, Matlei, was given to honor British paleontologist Charles Alfred Matley, who discovered many fossils in India. Its classification is based on the fact that nothing else is as big. The tibia is about 25% longer than that of Argentinosaurus. The region where the remains were found had monsoon seasons and combined with the sands and clades of the Calamido formation, creating water-saturated fossils which are very fragile. In the dry season, fossils will be subjected to expansion during the day and contraction during the night, possibly causing the remains to split apart. As a result, the bones were left in their original location in poor preservation conditions. In 2017, Galton and Ayasami reported that the Brahaschiosaurus fossils started to crumble inside their field jackets before the scientific agency, the Geological Survey of India, reached them and the evidence no longer exists. 
from the day of the discovery of the species, there was very little evidence collected or published. The characteristics were only supported by a few line drawings and photographs of the fossils as they lay in the ground. Some online researchers speculated that the bones might actually have been petrified wood. However, a 2022 review by Pal and Ayasami suggested that the skeleton was real and that the genus is likely valid and provided previously unseen photographs of the tibia bone at the excavation site and in a plaster jacket. As the only known remains of Brachiosaurus have been lost, the validity of the genus and its estimated size are under question. The lack of physical evidence puts Buhaskiosaurus as an indeterminate sauropod or as a nomen dubium. Perhaps, when a more complete fossil of Buhaskiosaurus is found and good enough to be examined, this dinosaur would gain a legal title of the largest dinosaur on Earth. These videos take a very long time to create. If you would like to support the channel and assist in improving it, then do please subscribe and give us a like, and consider joining our Patreon. Links in the description.